Let right up, show mum how it'll go up. I used to be allergic to fur. I couldn't grip at all with my fingers. Couldn't even grip a pencil. I felt all of the pain completely leave me from head to foot. Jesus is going to take it away. Never have it again. I was totally deaf in my right ear. Come on! Absolutely marvellous. Throw it to pieces. Must have proved. I can be a vet now, which I've wanted to be for a long time. But it was a marvellous sensation. Now open. Just relax. relax. God does it. God opens blind eyes. What can you see now? You can see me. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? For him, for him, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Father, we pray, we pray, our, with our whole heart we pray that you will guide our words, make each word count, help us to articulate truth in simplicity, so that every child, every person can receive it and embrace it and be blessed by your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated. I had some more ideas for the bishop about the miracle camp. I told him my ideas are brainstorms. And if I just keep them to myself, that's selfish. I, I'm a believer in brainstorming. <clears throat> at, at, our, at our headquarters, we brainstorm things. Just shoot off the mouth. Just talk. Just say things. In saying things, something good will pop out. Yeah. But if you keep yourself all cramped up, you'll never hear, you'll never get. So I, I couldn't get to him, so I, I wrote him. <laughs> what do you think of them? Beautiful. <laughs> you know, I said, please, they're brainstorms. I run out of ink on your printer, or I'd have done that in pretty. I had to do that in the hand. But I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to call it all church miracle camp? Yes. Yes. Yes, that's right. All church miracle camp. Yeah. All church. We're for everybody. And then I put penile down here in the corner. We, it's penile. But it, it's all church. Miracle camp. Come with faith in God. And that big tree, that, that tree gets me. I, I tell you, I want to go down there and pray. It just makes me feel big, makes me feel God is big. I thought, let's put a, let's put a sign on it. Let's chisel it in redwood so that it'll, it'll look old. Maybe sandblast it a little bit so it'll look old. You can sandblast it a little and it'll, it'll look nice. You see the grain of the wood, you know. And I thought, it's simple, but, but for people to think, God made this tree, God made you. He loves you. Wouldn't people feel nice when they walk up and see that on a sign on that tree? God made this tree. People don't think thoughts like that. God made that tree. It, it's a miracle camp. All churches, everybody can come. God made that tree. You may think of something better than that. God made this tree. God can fix you or something. I don't know. You know. <laughs> or God can grow you. You know. And I thought, he's been calling it the cedar of Lebanon. I don't like Lebanon. <laughs> They're not very popular. We Christians know what cedar of Lebanon is. Nobody else does. I said, call it the great penile cedar. 
It's a penile cedar. Now listen, people will talk that all over England, and they will, they will, they will actually think that that's authentic. They'll be asking questions. Huh? Uh, uh, they don't know where that sh species came from. <laughs> and, and, and you can tell them, you know, from penile. Well, you've got penile on your building over there. If you've got the right to call that building penile, you've got a right to call that tree penile. It's a penile cedar. But it's a great one. Great penile cedar. I put circa, circa, how do you say that in English? C circa 1650. Penile. And they'll figure penile's been around all that time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we're not trying to fool them. That's not trying to fool anybody. That's just being positive. And what you do with people is say things or put things before them. They'll think like that. And that'll make them happy. You see how happy all them folks were while they sang? Every one of them, all their teeth were showing. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's a happy church. Oh, I'd come if I didn't like anything else but them. I'd come and say, they're my ministers. I'd just sit there and be ministers. Then I'd tolerate him while he preached. <laughs> yeah. Ruth will always be here. She'll save you. She'll get you out of trouble. <laughs> She's tender. Then I thought, wouldn't that be nice to put a big sign up there with that little amphitheater around that big, gigantic tree. That's a treasure. That's a treasure in England. Search England. Show me another hundred trees in the whole nation that's that old and that wonderful, awesome, just beautiful. Around that little sanctuary made out of red wood so it won't rot, and with a nice little pulpit there, and, uh, and a cross, a big cross. A cross was made out of a tree. I even wrote down a whole bunch of scriptures. I looked through the Bible, see everything I could about trees. I found some wonderful ones. Yeah, I don't know how you use them. But I thought to put there your private sanctuary. You know, just your private sanctuary. And in smaller letters, Kneel and pray, receive your miracle. Then in bigger letters, God is here now. You know, people that, they don't, they go to church, they're cold, their religion is cold. They come out there, that warms them. And they'll kneel there. Look, they run off down there to Lourdes. And have a, them Catholics have put up signs and banners and priests run around with, hang, with little buckets of smoke and all this stuff to try to make folks feel holy. Well, we got a right to put up a sign when there's a, a tree that's almost 300 years old. God is in that place. Looks like I'm trying to talk myself into coming. Uh, well... I promise. But I did say to him, I did say to him, imagine in the big marquee with the choir behind you people in front of you and you'd be the first person to preach at the pulpit under the cedar tree that was put there for you the first person now, now, now he's he's picked on me all week now now I, I'm gonna dump on you I got something up my sleeve I've been waiting <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm telling you, Margaret, I've been saving something for him. <clears throat> you know, you got to deal with what I got to deal with. 
I have reserved August for the Ukraine. Yeah, I reserved it for the Ukraine in September because I know when that kicks loose, we're going to have to go to other cities. And I'm going to go prepared to stay till the devil quits. I believe in that. So now what are we going to do about the Ukraine? But here's, here's, here's the possibility. And this is why I haven't given you a strong response. We don't know yet what they're going to do over there. They've got a president that's mean. And he's the old communist guard. He swears he'll drive Christianity out of the Ukraine. Well, he hasn't done it yet. And he's getting nervous. I've been over there. And I'm shocked at what the government did to me. I mean, the government, they're mean. Is that all right to say that? Yeah. Just don't copy the paper. Huh? Yeah. 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 They're, 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 uh, they don't seem to have any value of Christians. And, and I told them, and I preached, I said, I said, we Christians and Bible preachers are the best thing the Ukraine's got. You're trying to make bad people good, and politics can't do it. Uh, uh, parliamentarians can't make people good. God can make people good, but you've got to have powerful preachers, and that's what we are. And, and this word circled among government. And listen, there's about 50 of the government parliamentarians and some of them in the Supreme Council that are believers. And they are working on this deal and, uh, and we'll have to see what happens. And uh, it looks like it's going to happen. We don't know yet. We don't know anything about And I'll give them a little bit of time, but not much. We'll have to see what happens. So what would you do if you used me? See, see I'm, I'm, I'm in a fix. I, I'd love to come and preach under that tent. <clears throat> and uh, you think British people would come? Yes. You think they'd come? Would you help spread the word? Yes. If I come, I'll send you over some, some ideas for a handbill and, and send it. He wants to put it on up on, what do you call it? Sky vision? Satellite. Satellite. I guess that's okay, but I am a believer in these leaflets. I never did have satellite. I've been all over the world. I never did have satellite. But I've had a lot of them leaflets. And put pictures on them. And give them to people. Send them in the mail to people. And give them by hand to people. And scatter them everywhere. Uh, they really impress people. And those that see it on sky, on, on television, will be impressed. But uh, let's not bank on that. Let, let's, let's print it if, if we're able to come. Hallelujah. Okay? But isn't it wonderful to know God where we can help people? We know we can help people. Wherever we are, we can help people. You can help people. You don't help people like I help people. Your voice is different. Your face is different. Your smile is different. But you're you, wonderful you. And God don't have anybody in the world like you. So if you don't do what, what God impresses you to do, it'll never be done. Nobody can take your place. I've always heard preachers pray, oh, if we don't do it, God will raise up somebody. That is not true. If we don't do it, it will not be done. Because we are us, whoever we are, and there's a work for us to do. And our face will affect certain people that nobody else can affect. We are special. I don't care how old you are, how young you are. We are individual, and God has his gift in us. We may not think it's worth much, but, uh, but keep talking. Keep talking about Jesus. It'll grow. You'll feel better. You'll talk better. You'll get better. Hallelujah. And that's the greatest life in the world is to share life. That's what life is all about. Now, I'm here tonight to talk about healing. We have had a wonderful week. And I'm here to talk about healing tonight. I, uh, 
there's one thing that I, uh, a thought came to me uh, a couple of years ago. <clears throat> well, first thing that happened to me, I was preaching in Uganda. There was a quarter of a million people there. Poor, right after the war. And, and, and the Ugandans are a proud people. They dress magnificently. Their hair, the, their, the, the, the gear that they wear on their head and their, and their clothing is spectacular. It's, almost, it's ostentatious. It, it, it's just too much. It's just glorious. But when we went there, they had been 13 years in war and they were in rags. Most of them, half of them didn't have shoes. The Ugandans were ashamed to be like that because they're a great nation. And uh, they'd been raped and brutalized and beaten and killed. Hardly a family in the nation that somebody hadn't been killed or their wife hadn't been brutalized or raped or hauled off into the jungle or their kids killed or the husband killed. Really sad. And uh, there was three armies fighting to rule the government when we were there. Now that's a crazy time to go. Practically no government. Just, just three armies shooting at each other. But they had calmed down far enough they did the shooting at night. So we, uh, the Lord spoke to us and said, go now. Well, when he speaks, we obey. It seemed very silly to go then. It wasn't a good time. But we went and uh, with the help of God found a big stadium three miles out of town surrounded by a 12-foot wall. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, the Lord impressed us that the people would be safe there. And it was a, an enormous field. The, the, the stadium was a little bitty thing over in the corner. An enormous field, at least a quarter of a million people there. And I was preaching to those precious people day after day. And uh, it, we had two meetings a day, 10 o'clock 10 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Everybody had to be home before dark. They shoot anything that moved after dark. So we all got home real quick, see? But, but we had freedom in the daytime. And the people came. Nobody thought they'd come, but they came. And the Lord spoke to me as I was looking at them. What rights do they have? Nobody has rights. And here I'm one of them preachers, covenant preachers. Covenant rights. Glory to God. You know, one of them preachers that backs God in the corner and say, come on, old boy, shell down the corn, hand over. Come on, you promised, hand it over, give it. I don't like that kind of preaching. A lot of preachers, they think they're preaching faith and they preach like that. And, you know, get God in the corner, you got to do it, you got to do it, you said you'd do it, come on, come on. No, 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 that's not faith. And, 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 and it came to me looking in those precious people's face. Do you have more confidence in your authority to cast out devils than you have in my healing love. Now think that over. See. Do you have more faith in your authority to cast out devils and heal the sick than you do in the power of my healing love? I loved them. I ministered love to them. It was wonderful what happened. God's love poured out to them. <clears throat> and wonderful things happened. Then a little while after that, I was preaching in America. And here's what the thought came to me profoundly. In our charismatic churches, the hurting people have come to feel uncomfortable. That's what came to me. I'm a minister of love. I love people. And we charismatics, we have a certain rhythm. We have a certain, a certain 
recipe, a certain formula. We'll teach you the Word of God. We'll teach you the promise of God. That's right. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Then we'll let you come and line you up, and we will lay our hands on you. And then, baby, it's up to you. If you don't get it, something wrong with you. I'm the saint. You're guilty of something, or you would have gotten it. Don't come back to me anymore. I did my thing. Are you hearing me? And hurting people have become uncomfortable and don't go. Because they have been made to feel, to, they have been shamed. It's insinuated. It's implied. It's not said. They don't mean to do that. But the form that we've developed puts shame on people if they're sick, if they've been around very long. May God help us never to do that. Sick people hurt. Yes, we preach the word. Yes, we're supposed to believe the word. Yes, we're supposed to take it and act on it and believe it. But the fact is, everybody don't seem to do that. God wants them to, and I'm going to talk about that. But when they can't seem to do that, we must preach again. With, we must love again and be compassionate again and minister again. We want them to feel first class, welcome to sit on the front row if they never accept their healing. We never make them feel uncomfortable. Never make them feel something's wrong. I've seen them, preachers line them up and lay hands on them. And, and in America, they've all learned how to cooperate. They all fall. Uh, they're supposed to do that, you know. And I don't want to say anything against that. Maybe some of you preachers do that. God bless you if you do that. I don't like that, but I'm not mad to anybody that does that. That's all right. If people want to fall, it's okay. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I don't have to fall to get healed. No. No. I can stand up and be healed. Jesus had folks stand up. He didn't touch people and they fell. But that's all right. If you do that, don't be discouraged. Hang in there because God will bless people. And if they feel in falling, they're obeying God. That's wonderful. And it'll help them. It'll help them. They need that probably. Their ego needs that. It makes them look spiritual. <laughs> what well, makes them? They cooperate. See? I'm holy, I cooperate with the preacher. He wants me to lay down, I'll lay down. We got a catcher, they'll catch me so I won't bump my head. <laughs> Is that sacrilegious? I don't mean it that way. I, I've probably seen more people healed than any man who's ever lived on this earth. And they don't fall. They don't fall. But, but there are millions of people getting healed who fall. I hope. I see them fall. I see him get up. I don't know. Nobody ever talks about what happened. They fell. That was the demonstration. That was the glory. Leave it to them. <clears throat> we don't want anybody uncomfortable. Nobody. If you need God, you are welcome. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I want you. I want the suffering people. I'll give you rest. I'll help you. I'll lift your spirits. And I'll bless you. Hallelujah. Healing is a wonderful blessing. And I love to see people healed. And I have seen so many healed. But I also know there's something that can happen in the spirit of a believer. Even if they don't get physical healing, that will lift them forever. And they will walk with God in a freshness of faith. I believe that. And I don't ever want them, if they come to my meeting and don't get healed, to go away dragging themselves in shame. I am not spiritual. I am not holy. I didn't cooperate right. I must have not have gotten the, 
the miracle. See, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. Healing, physical healing, is the Could I say the least valuable thing that God can do for you? Why? All miracles are only temporary solutions. By the way, do you know, brother, uh, uh, you know where Barnabas, uh, Bartimaeus lives? Have you met the old fellow? He must be very old now. Have you met him? Where is he? Where is he? Did he die? Sure enough. His miracle was temporary. You know Brother Lazarus? Anybody know Brother Lazarus? Is he your neighbor? You know where he lives? Is he in England or America? Or Russia? Or Jerusalem? Where, where, where's Brother Lazarus? Anybody know? He's dead. Dead? Jesus raised him from the dead after dead four days. Don't tell me he died. God's miracles don't last. Yeah, Lazarus is dead. See, Miracles are temporary solutions. They're good solutions. We've got to have them to win the world. If we don't have them, we're in trouble. But when you don't get the miracle that you're wanting, treasure what you get from God, a faith that you will walk with. And if you, if you, if you embrace that faith that we're talking about, even without your physical miracle, go in peace, go in joy, and you'll, 99 out of 100, you'll hatch off and get well sooner or later because that seed in you will produce the healing that you want. You believe that? Amen. That's kind of an intro here. <clears throat> I want to talk to you. I want to read to you out of Matthew. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, group of scriptures in uh, Matthew 8. Uh, Matthew 8, verse 16. Let's read verse 16 and 17. So many of you have your Bibles. Let's read it in concert. I think that's lovely to do. Let's read it together. Matthew chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. In concert. The first word's when. You ready? When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. He healed them all, to fulfill the words of the prophet that uttered under the unction of the Holy Ghost, Jesus, when he comes as our sacrifice, as our remedy, as our Savior, he is going to take your diseases and bear your infirmities. And when he takes them in his suffering, by those sufferings, you will be healed. And Jesus comes and they bring a multitude and he casts out the spirits with his word. It's interesting, isn't it, that he, it says he cast out the spirits. Wait, wait, check it up. Wait, I lost my place. It's interesting to notice this for some of you that might be new to what I'm going to say tonight. They brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. It looks like the devil has caused these physical problems in these people's lives, don't it? 
Now, we need to come to grips with that. I've written a little booklet, and I often preach this in a four-session seminar, Four Truths That Changed My Life. And the first one is, when I found out sickness was of the devil. Now, if I would undertake to prove that to you and preach that to you, my time would all be gone, and that's all I'd get to tell you. But, but take my word for it. Just think like this. Sickness is destructive. Sickness is a killer. The sickness working in you right now, if you treat it and coddle it and take care of it, it won't give up. It's just started. It'll kill you. It will kill you. It'll end up killing you. So don't be good to it. It is not a friend. It is an enemy. It is of the devil. That does not mean if you are sick, you have a devil. Never, never, never. If you are a Christian, you have Jesus. Jesus lives in you. But you are a spirit. You live in a house of flesh. See, someday our spirits will leave our bodies. Our bodies will still be there. Our house will still be there. It'll go back to the dust. But we will go away to be with the Lord. We, like God, we are spirit. And God has fixed it to put us in a human body of flesh. Now, over in my country, they, we have lots of termites. Evidently, you don't have many up here because uh, you're, it's cold enough. You know what a termite is? Uh, they're terrible little devils. They're these little bitty ants and just multiplied billions of them that will come and invade a house and, 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 and they'll work in any house that hasn't been sprayed. And they're there working on the foundation. They'll even eat through cement and they'll just eat away I've seen houses fall in. The floor falls in. These little termites. And of course, down in Africa, you know, they just, they just, they're awful. The hotter it is, you know, the more these termites love it. But in Oklahoma, we have them. Well, we have companies that make lots of money on the termites. They're glad. They don't say termite uh, ex 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 extermination. They say termite control. They want to keep enough of them alive so they'll stay in business. <laughs> See, <laughs> years ago they called it extermination and they got smart. They said, no, no, no. <laughs> Excuse me, can I say something real mean? The doctor don't want you to get well. He wants to live off of you. <laughs> now that's kind of mean, I know. But, but just keep that in mind. He's in business. He needs your money. And if you get too well, he won't give you the best cure. He'll keep you coming. <laughs> so we can go to God and get fixed up. Hallelujah. And we don't have to keep taking them prescriptions. Think about it. But those termites. So we, our house is contracted with the termite control. And they come every month and spray. Routinely, at the most every three months, and spray every wall, and go out and spray around the foundation, everything. In all the times they have come to spray, they've never sprayed me. <laughs> Why? I don't have the termites in me. They're in the house I live in. I wish preachers understood that about demons and sicknesses. Demons... That the, the oppressing spirits of sickness, spirits, the oppressing spirits of infirmity are not in you. You are a Christian. They oppress your body. They attack your body. It's your body that's sick, not you. It's your body that hurts, not you. Why does the devil work on your body? Well, he can't work on your soul, on your spirit. If you're saved, you're saved. Why does he work on your body? Because your spirit, that brilliant, beautiful, vivacious spirit in you that loves people and loves to help people and reaches out to people 
and touches people and visits with people and says good things to people. When you get sick and hurt and the fever burns and the pain racks your body, you don't smile and you don't reach out and touch people and you don't visit your neighbor and you don't go, you, you can't go preach and you can't go bless people and witness and you can't go to the street meetings and you can't sing happy and you can't be what God wants. The devil cuts you off by pain. Pain is a detractor. Pain dominates the mind, dominates the thinking, and we spend our time trying to make the pain stop. Nursing it, rubbing it, doctoring it, taking pills for it, having it operate on. A thousand things we're doing to try to stop the pain so that we don't have pain. It's the oppression of the devil to prevent you from being the wonderful minister or witness or helper in the world that God saved you to be. Sickness is of the devil. He's a tormentor and you play with him and he plans to cut you off and kill you through your sickness. He won't stop till he does that. You say, how are we ever going to go to heaven? Well, that's easy. Like Benson went to heaven. He wasn't sick. He finished his work, laid his head over, and was in heaven the next breath. I said he didn't die. He just went to heaven. You ever hear of someone going to heaven without dying? Benson did. That's right. A prophet of God. Enoch did. He was not for God took him. We think God took his body and translated. No, the Bible doesn't say that at all. It took him. He's a spirit. They probably found his body somewhere. We don't have record of it. I'm just supposing. But how do you know God took him? Took his, no, he took Elijah. But don't say anything about, about, about Enoch. He said he walked with God. And he, he, his spirit was not for God took him. His spirit left his body and went to heaven. That's what Benson did. He didn't die. You know, he said just before he died, he said, he asked some preachers, said, did you hear, ever hear of anybody going to heaven without dying? What in the world made him say that? You know why he said that? I know why he said it. I know Benson. I should call him the archbishop. That's all right. Oh, okay. Is it okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, so, so. I know why he said that. He said that because Benson believed that anything in the Bible was for now. Yes, that's right. If it's not, if it's, if it's in the Bible, we can have it. Amen. And he was troubled. He hadn't heard of anybody going to heaven without dying. And bless God, he had seen everything else, and he was concerned about that. And he was fishing around in his spirit. I know Vincent. He was thinking, that ought to happen somewhere. How are we going to get that to happen? That was on his mind. I'm convinced there's a lot of people that have gone to heaven without dying. We don't call it that. We don't say it like Enoch, because we think God took Enoch's body. Bible don't say that at all. Took him. When you leave your body, your body will be there, but it'll be dead. See? We got that idea from Elijah. Because Elijah went up in a chariot. See? God can do that. We're all going to go up someday. Hallelujah. But Benson went to heaven without dying. And I'm convinced a lot of God's saints have done that, but no one's been told. So I, I, I'm talking about a lot of them. I mean, great, great people. I was reading George Fox. I wonder how he went to heaven. That man, my goodness. You told me about a man that was dead a week. Yeah, William Tyndall. Tennant. 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 William Tennant. Was it William? William Tennant. William Tennant. I guess I don't know that gentleman. I'm not very smart in history. New England. New England. My country. William Tennant. And he was dead a week. A week. Whitfield's day. And 
And what did they do? They raised back to life. Raised back to life. Continued his ministry. You know, things have happened. There have been great people, and I'm convinced, great people that walked with God in a way that Benson did, that Enoch did, that most of us don't understand. I'm sure many of them have gone to heaven that way. Wonderful, isn't it? But back to the sickness of the devil. Does that help you to understand that? So when we rebuke the spirit of sickness to leave you, we might say to come out of you. It don't mean you. Your spirit, no. Don't ever let any preachers convince you that you've got a devil. Amen. No. But to leave your body alone, we have authority over them to cast them out and rebuke them and make them leave you alone. Hallelujah. You believe that? And some of you have been so schooled in religion, you just can't grasp that in 15 minutes. It takes time to churn through these things. See? I'll try to give you some good reasons. Oh, I wish I could give you seven of them. But look, let's start with this one. Did we read that scripture? Yeah, we read that scripture. They all got healed. Because the prophet said, he took all of our diseases and all of our infirmities. Now, so, so reason wonder number one for everybody to be healed tonight. I know God wants every sickness in this building tonight to die and leave you. I know that's what God wants. If Jesus was standing here visibly, he would say, yes, T.L., tell them, it is my will never that people be sick. You see what that conjures up? All these preachers that have taught us that maybe God uses sickness. Maybe sickness is of God. Maybe it'll teach us patience. And we say, I know Sister Sally, and she got sick, and she became so humble and wonderful. We know all them stories, and we believe them stories. And thank God that Sister uh, got humble during her sickness, but don't give sickness the credit. You know, I know Sister Brown. And people came. Somebody that wouldn't get saved came to their bedside and got saved. God used that sickness. Well... Thank God someone came and got saved, but let's not eulogize the devil. God don't have to use the devil to do his good work. Remember that. Remember that. So see, when I say these things, I'm trying to be careful with you, because I know some of you, maybe you're older, and, and, and you, you've been uh, all of your life schooled in religion. You've heard sermons, and you've sung it in the old hymns, and, and they've just got us convinced. That sickness, maybe it's God's will, maybe it's not, maybe God wants to heal us, maybe he don't, maybe he's got us in a school of learning. Maybe we're like St. Paul. St. Paul had poor eyesight and almost blind, and they led him around, had a thorn in the flesh. You know, they've convinced us the silliest thing. No truth at all, but religion, religion does those things to us. Now, it's real hard to break you loose from that. I just can't do it in one night. But I'll try. I'm trying. I'm working on you right now. I'm trying to slip up on your backside and get you to think it's impossible. And then I'll slip around and it'll happen. <laughs> see, see, if I can play with you like that and, 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 and gain your sympathy for my problem, then maybe I'll help you. Okay? <laughs> okay. Now, the first reason that I know it is God's will that every sickness die tonight is the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why do I say that? Okay, he, Jesus said, preach the gospel to every creature. Are you one of the creatures? Say out loud, I'm one of them. Okay, okay. You're a creature, one of God's creatures. Preach the gospel to you. Preach what to you? This is what the gospel is. Good news. What good news? Good news that Jesus bore your sins. 
suffered all of your sins, the punishment of all of your sins. Why? So you don't have to. So what? You're saved. When you believe that, you're saved. You believe that? That's how you got saved. Good news. Jesus, good news to the guilty. Jesus bore all of your guilt and condemnation and assumed it, took it upon himself. Why? So you don't have to be guilty. You don't have to be condemned. So what? You're free. You stand before God, clothed in his righteousness. Without with standing before, righteousness is the ability to stand in God's presence without the sense of guilt or fear or inferiority. That's righteousness. The righteousness of Jesus is committed to us. That's good news. Good news. Good news, who else? Good news to the sick. What good news? Jesus Christ assumed all of your diseases and infirmities and pains. It's stated clear. Surely he has carried our sicknesses and removed our diseases. That's written in the Bible. He healed them all. That it might be fulfilled what Isaiah the prophet said himself took our infirmities and bear our diseases. Why did he bear our diseases? Simple. So we don't have to. We don't have to. So what? By his suffering, we were healed. So when we believe it, we're healed. You say, well, how does that happen? I believe it, and I'm not healed. No, when you believe it, and act on it, and confess it, and talk it, and think it, and agree with it, and get happy about it, and praise God for it, and see yourself healed. See yourself among the healed. No longer, cut a, cut a line, draw a line. No longer do I number myself among the sick. I know where I go, what office, what room to go in, what window to peek through, where I'll get that little white piece of paper and they'll give me so many pills or so many things. I, I, I go there and, and they're lined up to get their pills. I no longer number myself among them. I've got the gospel pill. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. 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 I number myself among the healed. You number yourself among the saved, don't you? Yes. Do you say, I'm one of the sinners after you come to Christ? Never. Why? He bore your sin. You believe that. You're among the Christians. Take that. This isn't just an argument. This isn't just a sermon to yell at you and scold you. No, this is good news. He bore your sicknesses, my friends. Tonight, I say to you, in my presence, as a servant of the Most High God, anointed by the Holy Spirit, your sickness is condemned. Your sickness is condemned. Stands condemned before me as a servant of the Most High God that he has sent over here to England to minister to you. I am a minister. Christ is ministering through me, telling you good news. But he can't make it work in you until you accept it. Even at Nazareth, he could do no matey, great miracles because they didn't catch on. They didn't take it. But you're catching on tonight. You're believing it. Your spirit is receptive. Your sickness, can you accept it before God in the presence of witnesses? Angels that we cannot see are here encamped around us and with us. And the Holy Ghost here in his power 
that raised Jesus from the dead. We can't see it. We can't feel it. The Holy Ghost is here. Must be here because I'm here preaching. And when you preach the gospel, the Holy Ghost is sent from God to confirm that gospel. He never fails. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Lo, I am with you all way. The Holy Ghost is here now working in you that are responding and in your heart saying, yes, oh yes, I see it. I am among the healed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let that rise up in you. Let that warmth come up inside of you. Don't just sit and listen to a sermon. And if you want to, you can get up and run. You don't have to wait till I get through. Hey, I'll, I'll be preaching here till midnight if you don't get healed. I've got to preach till you get healed. See, I, I'm not going to pray. I, 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 it came to pass as Jesus was teaching, the power of the Lord was present to heal. That power is present now. It's Holy Ghost power. It's Jesus power. It's God power. It's miracle defeating power. It's gospel power. It is here now. And it is up to you to accept it. I don't mean to accuse you. To burden you. But you have the privilege of reaching up. If you can break loose from your, from your religious formality. And say hallelujah. It is for me. My brother fell off of a horse. We were farmers. Fell off a horse. My oldest brother, when he was just a kid, riding a horse. And he, the horse jumped and he sailed through the air and hit with his, the end of his spine right on the top of a big tree stump that had been sawed off. And it, 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 it almost paralyzed him. But then on the farm, we didn't have any money. He got well. He was young. Vivacious got well. When he got older, that thing was the problem. And my brother at the age of about 45, was going paralyzed. And the doctor said in five years he would be in a wheelchair. It was, it was, it was deteriorating. He was a Baptist. Never did receive the Holy Ghost like we Pentecostals do and speak in tongues. But, but he loved Jesus with all of his heart. And he loved me, his little brother, and he loved me to preach. And, and his Baptist preacher... The, what, the second healing campaign that we conducted after we saw Jesus was in a Baptist church. And, and, and that Baptist church became a believer in healing. That Baptist pastor, and he was a very intelligent man, but he became a believer. But one night I was preaching about this, just saying it again, how that Jesus took our diseases. Therefore, where are they? They're gone. How does that leave us? It leaves us healed. That's what it says. By his stripes, you were healed. And my brother was away in the back of that Baptist church, sitting on a pillow, had to carry a pillow everywhere he went to sit on. And he got up and yelled so loud, he, he didn't act like a Baptist at all. He yelled loud. You could do that and not act like a Britisher, you know. Yeah, <laughs> wouldn't that be wonderful? And he took that pillow and flung it around his head. He said, then by his stripes, I am healed. Wow. And he threw that thing down and it landed down there. But the pulpit almost hit me while I was preaching. My brother was healed. That was the end of his problem. He caught it. He believed it. He acted on it. He got up. He accepted it. He stepped out on it. Friends, that's what we have to do. You can do it. You can do it. You won't disturb us. Hallelujah. It's up to you. And when that settles in you and you begin to decide, yeah, it's real. It's true. It's for me. 
I'm not made for sickness. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Yeah, I got to do something. And, and that the heat begins to build up and you'll be getting ready. And in a little bit, you'll disturb my sermon and you'll get up and make a fuss. Hallelujah, a glory fuss. And we'll be as happy as they were the day they let the cripple down through the roof in Jesus' meeting. He's always happy for an interruption of his sermon if it's for a miracle. Hallelujah. Not for a devil, but for a miracle. I don't let devils ever interrupt my meeting. I pay them no attention. But when a miracle happens, I love it. Hallelujah. And Margaret, isn't it true? Already they'd be jumping up and running if I was down at your place. Yeah, 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 yeah. What you waiting on? You're Britons. You're beautiful. You love God. You're holy. You're real. Hallelujah. How many can say I'm getting it? It's coming. I believe it. Second <laughs> Corinthians 5:21. He has made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. That's how we got saved. Hallelujah. First Peter 2:24. Who him his own self bear our own sins in his own body on the tree. That we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. Of a certainty he has suffered our diseases and carried our pains. And by his stripes we are healed. Hallelujah. I am healed. I am saved. My sins are gone. My sicknesses are carried away. Only believe. Only believe. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus, help them to catch on. Help them to catch on. Matthew 8, 17. Himself took our infirmities and bare our diseases. That is fact. Amen. You don't pray to get it. It has happened. It is a gift purchased on reserve for you, waiting for you to take it. You can take it. Amen. You say, How? By saying hallelujah, it's mine, glory to God, I'm healed, I know it. Say, I'm getting ready to do that. I'm already doing it in my heart. And as soon as you lead all of us, so I won't be embarrassed by myself. That's what I'm planning to do. I'm going to say yes, it's for me. Okay. Okay, God's good. He'll just help you every way he can. Yes. Hallelujah. Only believe. It is done. Who for? Everyone. Result? Mass healing. You believe that? Yes. <clears throat> if healing is part of the gospel, healing is for everyone. For every creature. If every creature will believe, then you've got a mass miracle. You have a mass miracle every time you have, say, a hundred people come forward to accept Jesus. And we don't bat an eye. How do they all get saved at the same time? Some of them, it ought to take a long time. You know, we've got to agonize with some of them, pray longer. Well, some of them, we've got to think about it a little bit. A little, they'll get saved. See, why don't we talk that way about, we talk that way about sickness. No, not everybody all at once. No, no, that's too good. It's not for salvation. And which is the biggest miracle? Which is the most important, getting saved or getting healed? Getting saved. Getting saved. Healing is a temporary solution at the best. All of us that get physically healed, we're all going to die anyhow. So it's temporary. But it's wonderful to have it temporary because we don't hurt. We can help other people come to Jesus. Yeah. Glory to God. Amen. Are you with me? Yes. Every time a hundred people accept Christ, you've got a mass miracle. Hallelujah. Let me give you two or three more. Can you take two or three more? Yes. I, I just... That's the good news. Let's talk about the good power. What does the Bible say? The gospel is the power 
of God to salvation to everyone who believes it. Okay, what's salvation? All through the New Testament, it is clear the Word is an all-inclusive Word that includes physical healing, protection, vibrancy, health, forgiveness. We have dissected it and left it. Salvation means forgiveness of our sin, just part of it. Yes, forgiveness of our sin, but also healing of our diseases. Salvation includes healing of our diseases. That's why David, back in the Old Testament time, worshiped the Lord, said, don't for, uh, forget not all of his benefits. He forgives all your iniquities. He heals all your diseases. Salvation includes physical health. Now, let me say something straight. If you have salvation and you're saved and you know you're saved and you got sick, don't be condemned and say, Brother Osborne said salvation includes physical healing and I haven't got physically healed so I must not be saved. Don't fall into that trap. That's not true. The devil oppresses your body and tries to hang on. That happens because when you got saved, you didn't know healing was part of it. When you were young or in the Lord or newly exposed to the gospel, if you'd heard a sermon about Jesus being the healer and the savior and salvation includes both, you would have dumped your diseases when you dumped your sins and walked away well. They do that all over the world when I preach that to people that don't know the gospel. Just as natural, they dump their sickness just like that. But we're trained to keep our sickness in case God might need to use it to teach us some blessed lesson. <laughs> See, and it marks our minds, and so it stands in the way of us shedding that tradition. The hardest thing in the world is to cut off those barnacles of religion so that we can be, so that we can be free. To sail with Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the good power. The gospel is the power of God. That produces salvation. In everyone that believes. If everyone in here tonight that's sick. Believes at the same time. That your sickness is an enemy. And Jesus has conquered it and you refuse to tolerate it, and Jesus wants to heal you, and you believe the Holy Spirit is here with you, if every one of you believe that at the same time, every one of you will be healed at the same time. No problem whatsoever. Your sicknesses will go. That's good. You believe it? Amen. Hallelujah. 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 I know you're wanting to go to heaven. I know you're wanting to go home. I know you're wanting to go home, and I'd like to go home too. I'm tired. But I want to help you here. And I, I, these reasons are so solid. Hallelujah. Listen. The gospel is the power. The good news is the power. Some folks want to pray the power down. The gospel is the power. I preach the power out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm preaching it out to you right now. Are you receiving it? Yes. Hallelujah. Yes, the power is coming to you right now. Praise God. If 10,000 people hear and believe and act the same time, that's the mass miracle. That, that, that's what happened. It, it's simple. It's simple. And, and we've seen it 55 years all over the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everyone includes you. Say, everyone includes me. Everyone. It's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. Say, That's, that includes me. You want the third one? I'm cutting these real short. Oh, boy. They're powerful. But see, when you've got a religious mind, I need to stay on just one of them and quit. And just keep, just keep coming to help you break through tradition. And I'm rushing you too much. And I'm sweating because the clock, see, is not waiting on me. I want to help you. 
I want to help you. Let's take, let's take, for example, let's take, I said the good news, then the good power. The good news is for everybody. It includes healing. The good power, the gospel, is for everybody. It includes healing. Let's talk about the good God. <laughs> How about him? Is he for everybody? Well, what did he say? I am the Lord. I change not. Did he ever heal anybody anywhere in the world? He says, I am the Lord, I change not. The Bible says, there's no respect of persons with God. Did he ever heal anybody? Then he'll heal you. Because he's a good God. Exodus 12, 3 to 8. When God was going to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt bondage. A picture of salvation. An allegory. It was fact, but I mean the whole thing was, was served as an allegory for us, as an example for us when we come from sin and come into Christ. He told everyone to slay a lamb and apply the blood on the doorpost and eat the flesh. Now that, that's an allegory for us today. Thank God we don't have to slay lambs, put blood on the doorpost. But see, that was, a represent, that was representing Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that would be slain for us, and His blood would, 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 be, would, would be paid as a ransom for our sins. You understand that? He said, everyone do it. And verse 11 said, it is the Lord's Passover. Verse 27 and 28, here's what the people did. The people all bowed the head and worshiped and went away and did as the Lord commanded. That's cooperation. See, they did it. They did it. Hallelujah. You know, that's under the law. Not much for you to do. Only believe. That's easy, isn't it? Psalms 105, verse 37. He brought them forth. There was not one feeble person among all their tribes. Verse 42, for he remembered his holy promise. See, all them people, 400 years under slaves, they were sick, diseased, crippled, they'd been beat on, beat, imprisoned, tortured. How many of them among three million were sick and diseased and weak and fever? They all slayed a lamb. They all believed. They all marched out, and God said, I announce to you, I am Jehovah Rapha, your healer. And he brought them out, and there was not one feeble person among the tribe. That's Old Testament. This is a better testament. Yes. Hallelujah. You believe it? Yes. Everyone tonight, every sickness is cursed. Amen. Every sickness. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. I am the Lord that healeth thee. Psalm 105, verse 8, He has remembered His covenant forever. His word, which He commanded to a thousand generations. Say, that's to me. That's Psalms 107, verse 20, He sent His word, and He healed them. That's what He's doing right now. His word is healing you right now. If you had some kind of a microscope or some kind of an x-ray that you could see inside you where that sickness has been bugging you, you would see that thing curling up and dying under the preaching of the word of God because God is not dead. His word is alive. It's anointed and it is working in you right now. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Numbers 21, 45. The people became discouraged and they spoke against God and against Moses. That's unfortunate, isn't it? Fiery serpents bit them. And the Bible says, much people died. Verse 6, Numbers 21. That was Numbers, verses 4 and 5. And now verse 6 and verse 7. 
Moses prayed for the people after they repented. They repented. He prayed for them. God answered his prayer and offered deliverance to all of them. Offered it. Now listen. That's what he does. To, that's the important word. He offered it. He answered Moses' prayer. He'll answer my prayer tonight. He offers you his best. He said, here's what do. He said, take some fire. And mold a brazen serpent. And put it on a pole. That, the Bible says in John 2, you know, that as, Jesus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believes in him should not perish, have everlasting life. He said, take fire and make a brazen serpent, put it on a pole. Verse 8, everyone who is bitten by the poisonous serpent, when they look upon the brazen serpent, they shall live. Beautiful. A picture of Calvary. A picture of the cross. A picture of the resurrection. A picture of Jesus. A picture of our substitute. I wonder if all of them looked. I wonder if some of them said, that's silly. It won't do me any good to look at a brazen serpent. It's possible. Some of them might have stayed in their tent. They were hurting too bad to drag themselves to the edge of the door and look. And they died. Many died. They died everywhere. But God offered them all healing. All they had to do was they, they couldn't send their son or their daughter or their husband or their wife to go look for them. They had to look. That's the deal. Salvation is individual. We talk about mass healing. Mass healing doesn't mean there's so much power that if you get in the mass of people that you'll get healed. No. It means a mass of people all convinced at the same time that the gospel is real and that Jesus wants them well and they all at one time believe and accept it. That's the mass miracle. Just like mass salvation. You got it? Hallelujah. And everyone that looks at it shall live. Verse 9, it came to pass, <laughs> oh, I love this, if a servant had bitten anyone, when they beheld the servant of brass, they lived. Are you ready to behold, not the serpent of brass, but Jesus, the Lamb of God that assumed our diseases and our sins? Are you ready for that tonight? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Matthew 12, 13, 15. Great multitudes followed him. He healed them all. Matthew 14, 36. As many as touched him were made perfectly whole. Luke 6, 19. The whole multitude touched him. He healed them all. Has he changed? What's his will tonight? Are you ready? I can feel you're getting tired. I better close this and stop. There's a lot of good stuff in there, but I got to leave it. Okay. God's ready if you're ready. The offer is made. Now let me tell you one thing before we pray. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, but I'm going to pray for you first. There's a verse in here that I believe applies to us tonight. Let me see if I can find it. And see if it'll help you. You're, you might check your Bible, see if it says the same thing. In chapter 9 of Luke, it says that he gave his followers. Now listen to these words. First, let me ask you, do you believe the Bible? Yes. Yeah. I believe you believe the Bible. He gave them power and authority over all devils. 
Ugly ones, pretty ones, hairy ones, ball-headed ones, skinny ones, tall ones, fat ones. All devils. 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 Spirits of infirmity. S evil spirits sent to torment you physically, not your spirit. No, no, no. Your spirit is saved. You're right with God. Don't ever question your salvation. But he sent to hurt you, to oppress you. He gave them, does that include us? Yes. Says disciples. You believe that includes us? Yes. I believe it includes us. Are you a disciple of the Lord? Yes. He said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Are you one of them? Yes. Sure. He gave them power and authority over all devils. All oppressing spirits. And to cure diseases. Now that stumps me. But what it is, is the Holy Spirit and His power and Jesus, the resurrected Christ who lives in us. It's Him that does the work. When we pray and when we reach out to people, it's Jesus that comes among the people. He says, I've given you the power to cure diseases. It's Him alive in us. And out from us radiates His goodness and His love and His power. It comes to you. It comes to you. Hey, you can't see it. Let me help you a little bit. Look, right now, you got a telephone? You carry a telephone all the time. One of them little things you stick in your pocket? You got one? I'll declare. You got one in your own pocket. How many has got a telephone on you? L look at the telephones in here. Right? What's going on? Right now, all over the world, millions and millions of voices are flowing through this auditorium right now. All over the world. If you have the right buttons, you can pick it up from Russia. You can pick it up from America. You can pick up someone talking in Australia. Or you can pick up, if you have the right little apparatus, all sorts of shows and performances and stories and personalities and talks and voices and people. They're all running through here right now. Does it strain you for me to say signals go out from me? Jesus, risen from the dead, coming out to you. You say, oh, cool down, preacher. I can't see nothing coming from you. Come on, you got it all around you. You got the technology that proves it. That ought to help your faith. We're people of God. I'm not holding you late because I want to. I want to go to bed and get on that plane and go home. Find my piano and my roses. I love you. I'm an old man. I don't like to preach this long and yell my head off. I got to get through your British crust. <laughs> But other people have crust too. But see, I'm trying to help you. I'm staying up late to help you. Hallelujah. You're beloved of the Lord. God loves you. God don't want you hurting. Hurting is of the devil. We have authority over the devil. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead. I'm going to pray for you. Then I'm going to lead you in an acceptance prayer. And, and it'll be a prayer of praise. When we believe we have received, we become happy. You can't work it up. If you don't believe you've received, you won't be happy. But if you believe you have received, you'll be happy. You believe it not because of what you feel. You believe it because of what God said. You believe it because you're looking away to the cross where Jesus was beaten at the whipping post and by those stripes you were healed. He took your diseases and that's what you're thinking of and pondering and it makes you happy. Yes, I believe that. That's in the Bible. That's got to be true. If he took my diseases, then I don't have them. He could, if he took them, he didn't leave them on me. I believe, I believe, and they drift away like a cloud. They die from that moment, and they, 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 they dissipate like an ugly smog. They dissipate, 
and you find yourself in new health. Hallelujah. You believe that? You believe that? That's not imagination. That's true. And I wanted to explain this to you. See, a spirit of infirmity. Think about this. Referring to this, I give you power over all devils to cast them out and to cure diseases. And I've tried to impress you that sickness is caused by a spirit of infirmity. Think about sickness. Take cancer, for example, or tumor. How did it get there? How did it get there? Where did it come from? How did it get in your body? Think about that. It had to be a spirit of infirmity. Now, I don't understand all about that, but it's got to be that. A spirit of infirmity. We're in a spiritual world. We are living a spiritual life. God and angels and devils and Satan, we're in a spiritual world. We're all tied up in this physical body with eyes that can only see what we can we hear, smell, taste, feel, and see. You know, we're, we're in that kind of a world. But we're in a spiritual world. The unseen world is far more real than the world that we can see. The Bible says everything that we can see, that is made out of what you can't see. Now think about that. That's fact. That's fact. Heaven. You can't see it. We're in a spiritual world. And in that spiritual world, demons do what they can. Among sinners they rule. And among Christians, those spirits of infirmity come and try to nag us and hurt us. They don't bother our soul. No, we're saved. How'd they get there? And some way, I don't understand how, maybe in the time of a wound or an accident or some sickness, I don't know how it happens, but they embed themselves in you and something starts developing. And it starts building, it, I, I think it's a seed of the enemy. And it starts building a body around it. And the tumor grows and grows and grows. Or, or it's, it's, it, it's, it's a spirit of, of bondage or something, arthritis. Maybe we'd call it a binding spirit. I don't know what you call it. We don't have to call it nothing. Who cares? It's the devil. You know, I, I, I don't like these preachers trying to become doctors and name everything. We've just got angels and devils. We, we don't have all these fancy names. We haven't been to uh, school, medical school. We don't know those names. <clears throat> you that study medicine, you know those names. But when you go to pray, you don't have to use them names. You don't use your scalpel. No. See, it's different. But when those spirits are there, and, and, and here, how'd that tumor get there? Little by little by little. How'd you get here? How'd you get here? Where'd you come from? <clears throat> your mama and your papa had a relationship, and the result was a seed arrived in your mother's womb. And that little seed was you. I don't understand that. Do you? Can you explain that? I can't explain that. But it grew, and it grew, and a little body formed around it. And pretty soon, here's a precious little being that's about to come to this world. And it'll grow up, and it'll be an adult, and it'll grow old. And when it's old, and its life is fulfilled, that same little spirit will leave it. Daisy has left her, and her little body was dead. Her body was still there, but it was dead. didn't breathe anymore. I held it, but it didn't move. Her body was there. Where was she? Her spirit left. Okay? And we took her out to the grave and planted her precious little body beneath the soil. And 100 years from now, you can dig her up and can't find her. She'll be gone. Goes back to the dust from when she came. I will too. 
You will too. What about your sickness? There's a spirit of infirmity that has come to you to destroy you. We have authority to rebuke them and command them to go if we believe. And our authority is because Jesus lifted our burden, took our diseases, bore our infirmities. It's a redemptive right to rebuke those devils that have infringed on our health to hinder us from serving Jesus Christ. We can rebuke them, cast them out. We have authority over them. When we do and they depart, they will depart. Surely they will. He said you have all authority over devils to cast them out and cure disease. I believe. Say, I believe. I believe. Well, when that spirit leaves that tumor, it's dead. There's no life in it to make it function. The life of it is gone. What will happen to the tumor? If it's a miracle, an instantaneous miracle, God by his power dissolve it and it'll be gone. We've seen that hundreds of times. But even if it's not that, the tumor will be dead. What will happen? It will disintegrate. Your bloodstream will carry it off cell by cell, cell by cell, distributed until it disintegrates and it's all gone because there's no life in it. That's how it got there. Little by little by little, those cells came and built it up around that life. When that life's gone, that leader's gone, he's gone, hallelujah, then that thing will start going away and away and you'll get well. That's why Jesus said, lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. The power of God comes upon them. Many of them instantly healed. Oh, I love that. I wish I could get everybody instantly healed. But it don't seem to work that way. But when we pray with faith and believe the scriptures and believe in salvation, we have the right to pray and rebuke those spirits of infirmity. They will go. They will go. Only believe. Hallelujah. And then get well. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And expect an instant miracle. You can have it. God's in the instant miracle business. That's what we want. And the way to do that is to be bold in your faith and put your faith into action. Do what you couldn't do before we prayed. You can't do it now. You can after we pray. You can't walk now, you can after we pray. You can't hear now, you can after we pray. You can't see now, it'll be, you can see after we pray. Are you understanding? Yes. But we have to, we have to put our faith into action. Stretch forth your hand. I can't, it's barely. No, stretch it forth. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Little old woman, one of our meetings, 14 years, her legs twisted. She walked with her hands, twisted her legs. Her last child was born. Something happened in her spine, and her legs drawn to her side. 14 years dragged. The sides of her legs were like leather. She sat out there among a multitude of people on the ground. Poor thing. She couldn't even stand up. So everybody standing around her, she couldn't see anything. But she listened. And she believed. And we preached. And she received Jesus. And we prayed for healing. And she believed. And she tried to get up when other people were getting healed and shouting and giving testimony. And she couldn't move. And she tried again. And she couldn't move. And she looked up. She wasn't discouraged. No, oh, Jesus, I know you're healing me too. I know you're healing me too. She was happy. Not, oh, God, why not me? No, no. Oh, Jesus, I know you're healing me too. Your powers everywhere. And tried it again. And about the third time, she felt her knees move. And they wiggled, and she moved them, and she got up. See, she never gave, she believed. You ready to do that? Put your faith into action. When we get through praying tonight, if you couldn't raise your arms, raise them. If you couldn't wiggle your arms, wiggle them. If you couldn't twist your neck, do it. If you, could, if you had a tumor, hallelujah, expect it to be gone. Are you ready? Yes. Let's stand to our feet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus is here. Jesus is here.
Oh, Jesus is here. Jesus is here. I want you to say, Jesus. Jesus. I receive your healing. I receive your healing. You are my minister. You are my minister. You are ministering to me. You are ministering to me. The sickness that I have had. Is caused, by a of is caused by a spirit of infirmity that has been destroyed tonight has been destroyed and tonight. has left me. I am healed. I am healed. The, life the life of my sickness is gone. My sickness is dead. I believe. Hallelujah. I believe. I am made whole in the name of Jesus. Now, raise up your hands. Say, right now, I'm healed. Right now, my heart is full of joy. Right now, I'm made new. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Not the house of sickness. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Clap your hands. Clap your hands. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's done. It's done. It's done. It's done. It's done. It's finished. Hallelujah. Thank him. It's finished. Hallelujah. It's finished. It's finished. It's finished. Hallelujah. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. What do you think about this? This is authentic. This is authentic. This is authentic. Jesus has passed this way tonight. And listen, he don't just heal while we pray. He begins when we pray. When you make contact and you decide this is mine, he starts. And his work of grace follows you. Some of you will wake up in the morning healed. You say, oh, you know, I really did get healed last night. <laughs> you'll find it out tomorrow in the morning. Some of you, while you're working, you'll discover it. Some of you, two or three days now, you'll say, ever since I went over there that night, I haven't been hurting as bad. It gets better every day. Hallelujah. I never thought about that. I, I, I'm getting well. It will happen, friends. It will happen. You believe it? I'm sorry I've kept you longer. I want to go to bed too. But you know, we, we, we have to help people. We've all worked with the hurting people tonight. You've helped me. The choir, my goodness, they must need to go to bed. But you've helped me. You've believed with me. And we've helped people tonight. We've helped people tonight. We've helped people tonight. God, through his word and by his Holy Spirit and through our love, has helped people tonight. And people are going to have a new life from this prayer this time tonight. Amen. Because we focus on the redemption of Jesus Christ and have embraced it. When you embrace it, you embrace Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 I have a beautiful piano at home. And since Daisy went to heaven, of course, I've always had a piano and always played uh, for myself. Uh, being able to play got me in the ministry. That old preacher that asked me to travel with him and play for him, I've often thought if I hadn't, a, we had an old pump organ on the farm. I was the only one of the children of, we were 13 children. I was the only one that was interested in that old pump organ. My mother was a guitarist. My dad played the French harp, and we called of, uh, all some different instruments. But I was attracted to that old organ and notes. And so when I was so little that I'd have to hang on with one hand and play with one hand so I could pump with my foot, <laughs> and I played that old organ. And then all through the years, I've loved the notes. And uh, so then in later years, we, we've always had a nice piano. And uh, since Daisy went to heaven, I play the piano much more than I did before. It's, it's an emotional release for me uh, when I'm lonely or sometimes when I'm writing and I get gridlocked for words. 
I can go play the piano a little while, and I'm all freed up. I can go, I can write some more. So I'm playing for me, and you can listen. <laughs> I'm not a professional. I'm just a happy person. <laughs> so I enjoy playing. You who are pianists, and you have a great pianist here, a great keyboardist, you who are professional will understand that there's no discipline in my playing. I just play. So there's lots of rough notes, but I'm happy playing. And so as I play, let me play as a non-professional, just a farmer sitting at the keyboard, playing, enjoying himself, and hoping that you enjoy it. And uh, <clears throat> I might play something you would recognize. I might not. Something I might recognize. I might not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I played a little bit last night. He said, what was that? I said, I don't know. <laughs> but, but it's happy. And I play to the Lord. Yes. To the Lord in me. The Lord must be a musician. He must love music. So even my music, he loves because he has music all around him in heaven. So music is a, is a gift of God. That's why I sit over there and cry every night. These people sing, I'm telling you. This is the most wonderful choir I have ever been around in my life. And I've been around a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. And I tell you, and I tell you, if you could read, if you could read, of course, you understand most of the words that they are singing. Every song is a dynamic, powerful, miracle sermon. It's just wonderful. So there's no words to this, but just, uh, just ponder, tonight is my night. I like what the bishop keeps saying. This is a special day. So as I play a little bit, this is your day. This is the day the Lord has made for you. You've come, you've gathered in this holy place. We are God's people. Uh, there's a song. Uh, do you sing it here? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's something about your name. Uh, that, that's a nice one, isn't it? I might wander around and play that. And, and, then, and then I might go off into something like uh, maybe Amazing Grace, because what else fits after Jesus? His wonderful grace. Or maybe what a friend we have in Jesus. Something like that. I don't know what I'll run into. I don't have a plan. I can't read music. But I'm happy. <laughs> I'm ha <laughs> yeah. And I play a piano, not a keyboard. I don't know much about these. He said he's got it fixed up.
Jesus bought me, and he made me a priest and king, and to keep my feet from falling, and that is why I sing, hallelujah for his faithfulness, for the glories of his Son, I will never cease to praise his name, for all 